things theology, all things theology. We chop it up properly without an apology. Gotta give doxology to God hollow because this is how we do it at all things theology. Yo, grace and peace. Welcome back to another episode of All Things Theology where I'm your host K-Dub. And today I want to review the Owen Strong versus Jermaine Reverend Jermaine Marshall video. But before we get into that, <laughs> if you have not watched the discussion that me and Reverend Jermaine Marshall did, I encourage you to watch it. Some very uh, shocking things, some um, <laughs> some new revelation for us, <laughs> so to speak, that we, we encountered. No, but we had a great conversation. Um, I, I do respect him on a personal level um, because he was very kind, um, you know, but I do think I challenged his position and yeah, I encourage you to watch it. If you're watching right now, I want to encourage you also to like this video, to subscribe to the channel if this is your first time watching, and also to hit the notification bell for future episodes. Also, guys, if you don't know, we have a podcast. If you don't like listening uh, to the YouTube video, you're like, man, it's so much easier when I'm at work or whatever to to just, um, you know, listen to the podcast. Well, it's on all podcast apps. Uh, download the all or subscribe to all things theology and you can hear it as well so guys i just want to get into this video get my thoughts on that and yeah let's let's just get it let's see what uh reverend Jermaine said in the dialogue with owen strong um grew out actually out of my doctoral dissertation which by the way i completed at a very conservative um institution i'm not a conservative christian at all <laughs> <laughs> i think that might be the uh least shocking thing uh that he said in this dialogue especially you know since you if you watched the uh discussion i've had with him that that might be the least shocking thing he says here <laughs> but let's continue <laughs> but i uh well i guess it depends on how you define conservative christian but but um this dissertation was completed at a conservative um University. Nevertheless, my dissertation was entitled um, "The Scandal of Christianities in British." You know, just for fair use, I, I gotta say this. I caught it quicker than I have in my uh, <laughs> previous videos. I did chop up the video, never to uh, misrepresent him. It's always in context, um, but just to, so we can get to uh, things uh, faster, because I don't disagree with everything he says in this. I mean, I think that's impossible for someone to disagree with everything someone says but just to get to certain things he says that uh i want to cover in this video the video is chopped up just for and it's for fair, fair use by the way only america and the early republic from 1730 to 1835 um and so i'm very clear that there is no monolithic christianity um that there are christianities and what i have discovered in my research and experience is that there are historically um, there have been um, oppressive white Christian theologies that have normalized um, the belief of, of, of white supremacy and white privilege um, resulting um, in what I call white Christian supremacy. And this and, and you know, to, to offer pushback, there have been all kinds of ethnic abuse uh, in the name of Christ. Um, I, I find that woke people generally only want, want to speak to that, to, to white people. And then, you know, what, what often happens if, you know, you know, they'll they'll take this past truth that there were white oppressive, white supremacists, uh, people who claim the name of Christ and they oppress black people. That is true. But what they do is take that past truth and apply it onto people today. And that's that's what I'm pushing back against. That's what I'm. Not not to say that there aren't white people that do that, but to generalize white people as a whole, which he does. He does do in this. I mean, he just did it there. And so we'll get into that. And my theological trajectory historically shows that that this begins with the enlightenment, um, with the enlightenment. And, and the scandal of the enlightenment is equating whiteness with perfection. And as now, you know, I've studied church history and, you know, he's going to claim that the Puritans. Matter of fact, let me let me let me allow him to finish his sentence. So he says the scandal of enlightenment is uh, equating whiteness with perfection. As far as oppressive white Christology, um, theologies are concerned, what I discovered in my research is um, Puritanism um, um, really adopted this ideology in its theology 
um, and in my book I argue that Puritanism um, constructs a theology of white of of white superiority. Um, and what what Reverend Jermaine does a lot, he'll 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 make a claim and assume it's true. Doesn't provide really substantial argumentation. It's just well, the Puritans uh, had this Enlightenment idea that whiteness meant perfection or or you know superiority. Um, doesn't doesn't substantiate how that's true and that that's a lot of times like i mean even in our discussion if you watch he'll he'll just make the claim and just assume it's true without and uh we'll discuss that more later but um <laughs> you know i i don't think one can make the argument that the puritans as a whole thought that i mean can you find a puritan that uh was a racist absolutely <laughs> you can find that with any movement um you know, some some racist or some some um, some sin that is a uh, reprehensible. So that's not my point. My point is to generalize the Puritans as a whole to say that they believed white was right. Um, I mean, yes, yeah, that's that's read the Puritans. That's all I would say. And theoretically, the Puritans would suggest that their covenantal theology is grounded in in irresistible grace uh, which is problematic for me as well theologically because obviously I'm not reformed but actually it's not what I discovered and uh, he's Wesleyan so obviously that's going to get into some um, and I say what he, he in our discussion he informed me that he was a Wesleyan and obviously I have major difference on the uh, man's nature with Wesleyans but that's not the point let's continue not grounded in, in irresistible grace is actually grounded in race and 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 this particular theology enables the puritans to exclude non-whites from the doctrine of election particularly their doctrine of visible sainthood i'm not familiar with i mean like i said i'm sure you can find one a couple of puritans who i guess maybe made an election central to white but the whole i mean even you know you even look at the 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 children of the uh um the puritan movement people like uh george whitfield um argued for the equality of black people now a lot of people well he had at slaves and so all right you can argue he's inconsistent but that doesn't change the point that he argued for the equality of black people um you know jonathan edwards same same goes uh you know then you had many black men like lemuel haynes um i mean the, the list goes on but but to argue that they were making the point that election was rooted in, in, in white supremacy. I mean, that's insane. I mean, but you do have movements today who do that, uh, like the black Hebrew Israelites. Um, they're one of the ones who do do that, you know? So <laughs> I, I would be curious on his thoughts about them. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's, it's, it's obviously, it's a huge thesis and, and I would encourage people to obviously read it yeah. um, to, to get the full sense of, of yes. all the different, you know, historic, uh, traditions of Christianity that you you look at in this particular way. I mean, coming right up to the present, you obviously believe that the evangelical church, especially in the U.S., is still in the grip of essentially theologies that involve the normalization of white supremacy. So, so just speak to that for a moment, because obviously you you take this right up to date with you oh, know, yes. the latest election yes, of yes, Donald yes. Trump and so on. Exactly, and Go and I, and yes, I, Donald Trump, the election of Donald Trump, um, the propelling of his political career. Um, is the primary example um, um, of how this theological scandal, this corruption of the gospel of Jesus Christ, um, which uh, promotes and enables uh, white supremacy and, and, and white superiority and white privilege and white nationalism, is most evident in the white evangelical tradition's um, support of, of the most ungodly, immoral um, um, <laughs> I mean, like, like, like I said, he, he doesn't he doesn't substantiate that. So if you were pro Trump as opposed to I, I mean, think about it. He was running against a white person. I mean, both both times. So how would how would not Hillary or Biden be representative of uh, what he calls a white supremacy if you supported them? Nevertheless, um, Trump Trump wasn't is so a lot of people that I'm familiar who voted for Trump didn't vote because they thought he was a godly man or, or good Christian. 
they voted just because, like, man, his politics are better. I mean, it has nothing to do with it. We're, we're, we understand we're not voting for Christians um, when we when we vote. I, I wish that was the case. <laughs> but, you know, the president isn't the pastor. But, yes, we do want uh, Christian qualities. And so many Christians were like, hey, as opposed to Hillary or Biden, he exhibited that better. Um, not in a moral sense, not, not that he was a moral uh, person that we sh you should follow. But, hey, his policies. That's what the concern was. And so I, I don't know how voting for Trump proves you're a white supremacist or or a white nationalist. I mean, like like I said, it's not substantiated. It's just asserted. Um, you need to follow along with me and, 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 and agree with what I'm saying. But it's never substantiated. So if you're waiting for the <laughs> the proof, you, you just got to agree. And, and this is how it's done most of the times in woke woke. Uh, uh, movements, uh, you know, things like January 6th is the greatest, uh, you know, <laughs> proof of white supremacy. Well, why? Well, you just got to you just got to agree with it. All right. The cool candidate for president in modern history. And unfortunately, I think what has happened is, is that uh, and I realize it's not everyone in, in the white ev evangelical tradition, but from what I've discovered, it's the majority. And we wow. see that in the voting patterns. Um, and so what, what that tradition unfortunately has become, in the, at least in the United States of America. So, like I said, how? America is a cult. It is, in my book, you see, I call it the cult of Donald Trump. Um, and it's modern. So voting for Trump, like <laughs> preferring Republican principles over Democratic policies means you're in a cult now the other way I, I i would like to press this issue if i had another conversation um w would the other way be viewed as a cult Pro probably not you know so that's the interesting thing christian um modern christian evangelical supremacy well first of all and I, 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 and 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 if Owen has looked in my book i think he will see that um i'm not suggesting that it's only the reformed tradition um, that justifies and practices slavery at all. I mean, I think, you know, I cover the gamut of what I call oppressive white um, Christian traditions. But but look at that. Even right there. OK, he says, you know, not all white people are involved in this, but he calls like but even that he calls slavery. Oh, let's go back to, to hear what he what he calls slavery, all, all sorts of slavery. Notice what he calls it. Hold on. Let me go back here. I think he will see that um, I'm not suggesting that it's only the reformed tradition um, that justifies and practices slavery at all. I mean, I think, you know, I cover the gamut of what I call oppressive white um, Christian traditions that oppressive white Christian traditions. <laughs> I guess so. All all of slavery is wrapped up in this term of, of oppressive white Christian traditions. I mean. Oh, boy. Um. Um, fostered and practice um, slavery. Um, my issue is the issue that I expose in my book is what, as you said, Justin, the theological scandal. And and the issue here is that theologies of election are dangerous. And at the heart of the Reformed tradition is the theology of election. I'm, I'm gonna let him expound a little bit more on that, but I mean. He's saying any the it, he's because he's saying theologies of election are dangerous. So if you have a theology of election, you, you're dangerous. I mean, so what do you do with the Bible with election? OK, I understand you can have different understandings of, of election. Obviously, many of you guys know I'm a Calvinist. I'm reformed. And so I, I, I do believe in predestination. I do believe in election, sovereign election, sovereign predestination, that God chooses a particular people for himself, for his own glory. And so. Yeah, that's not a problem with me. I understand God can God can do as he pleases in that sense. Um, but we're going to see how he even even like he takes his wokeism into every discussion. Like I said, I, I do think uh, Reverend Jermaine is a very nice uh, person. Like, man, we had a great conversation. But watch this. And I, and I document this i show this in my book i show it with the puritans with their theology of 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 white superiority i also show it with the anglicans and their theology of white privilege um, um a theology 
uh <laughs> reverend jermaine is in harlem by the way so that's why you hear the uh <laughs> that's why you hear the uh the sirens a predestinarian election theology is the kind of theology that results in the belief that even black Calvinist evangelicals like Phyllis Wheatley and Lemuel Haynes and Jupiter Hammond, even they believe that their enslavement was God's providential will because of their Calvinist theology. Yeah, I mean, that's what the Bible teaches. You look at texts uh, and... Um, I believe I, I believe so in some of these clips, I do have Owen responding and I think he's right on the nail. Like you have you have text. I mean, the greatest tragedy ever to human on, on, you know, to humanity was the cross of Christ. Yet we know in scripture that God predetermined that. And so one, he's confusing election and um, predestination, you know, in providence. So so it's kind of conflating categories and just smushing them all together and not distinguishing them. So, um, so, you know, many black Calvinists believe that God providentially brought them through slavery. Yes. I mean, what, what's the issue with that? You know, biblically speaking. So, um, yeah. It's a very dangerous theology. So if you believe that God has providentially, uh, brought whatever so happens to pass, you're, you're, you're dangerous. That, that God brings you through things. And a and, and matter of fact, he's even using them for good. It, you know, if you believe that, just according to Reverend uh, Marshall, that's dangerous. Let's talk about specifically, and come back to you at this point, Jermaine. Um, you, you've had a chance to see Owen's book. You can see how he sees that CRT and the kind of what he terms the social justice movement is a, he sees it as the major concern, the danger for the church in uh, to what extent, firstly, do you agree with his definition of CRT? To what extent do you think it is a concern in the church uh, versus the concerns you have um, ar around the racism that you believe obviously still exists and, and uh, in, in the evangelical church, especially today? I mean, I appreciate Owen's agreement that that race is a social construct. I do appreciate that because uh, it's true. It's not only a social construct, it's also a political construct. And as my book reveals and exposes, it's a theological construct as well. Uh, he, he made multiple references to his book. I, I might have to get it. <laughs> I might have to get and do a review. And so um, I certainly agree with him there. And he even says in his book that he agrees with critical race theory on that. Um, however, otherwise, um, this is my understanding of, 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 of critical race theory. And it comes directly from the critical race theories. Uh, Richard Delgado um, is that racism against people of color is the normal experience of people of color. And as a person of color, that is true. I can tell that is true. I mean, this one is, um, you know, an, an assertion. Like I said, it, it just asserts racism is the normal, normal ex experience of the people of color, i.e. black people, minorities. I mean, possibly be thrown in that mix, but definitely black people. I mean, because he says, hey, it's definitely true of me. So it's actually abnormal, abnormal for him to not experience racism. And then, you know, you get into things like races. I mean, he said in our uh, discussion, you know, things like that demonstrate white privilege and white. Um, yeah, white, white privileges. You know, someone may watch this discussion and see uh, him, you know, being passionate and say, oh, that's an angry black man. And then they'll watch uh, Owen, who argues just as passionately as him and say, oh, he's just passionate. And I was just like, come on, man, I. I, I think that would be absurd to come to that conclusion watching this discussion. I think both gentlemen uh, handle them well, handle themselves well as far as emotionally. Um, so but it's just assumed. And if you disagree with the assumptions of critical race theory, often um, critical race theory or like woke woke theology, it's I mean, disagreeing with the assumptions and the conclusions are actually the proof how racist you are. But no evidence is offered to substantiate that claim that was just made. It's just true. And then what do you do with the other people's experience? Let's say it was true for him. What do you do with black people like me? Uh, thousands, millions of black people who 
their uh, everyday experience isn't normal or, or is it isn't racism in its normality. What do you do with those black people? Well, oftentimes it's like, well, you're not really black or you're Uncle Tom. You're a sellout. All, all this all this extra rhetoric. I'm not saying that's what uh, Jermaine would do. I don't I don't think he would just from conversing with him. But that is the common um, response. That's a fact. Racism against people of color advances the entrance of both of both white elites and white working class. I believe that to be the case. Race and races are products of societal invention and manipulation. I clearly show that trajectory theologically, socially, politically, and otherwise from the enlightenment to present day in my book. And I also understand critical race theory is suggesting that voices of color, people like myself, reflect the histories and experiences of oppression endured by people of color. That's the way I understand critical race theory. And that there is systematic racism in America and that this country was founded as a racist society. And it's and well, obviously that last statement I would uh I think it needs to be more nuanced, but you know, oftentimes you ask you know, a woke proponent, well, what is the greatest proof of uh, systemic racism today? And they all, 90% of the time, I won't say all, majority of the time, they'll do what he did. They'll go back to the past. And and even when I asked uh, him about our discussion on systemic racism, one of the examples were just so vague, but it's generally going back in the past. Jim Crow, slavery, those major events to, to where anyone would say, yeah, well, OK, yeah, that that's clearly racist. But I'm asking about today because you're the the argument, the claim, the uh, assertion is that systemic racism exists today. Um, no one's arguing that the effects of those events don't still have ramifications, but the ramifications aren't the proof of the systemic racism. So that's that's you have to uh, be clear you have to be careful when listening to those arguments to to see what the conclusions actually are in the uh, presuppositions. It is. That's a fact. That's not fairy tale. Is 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 not a, a rejection of the gospel. It's just a fact. Um, and just a fact. Believe it. Oh, so, you know, I think um, rejection of critical race theory. Uh, particularly the part of critical race theory, and, and I'm really just dealing with the the racial discrimination part. Owen actually goes into more stuff, which I, I don't, you know, I wasn't asked to come and deal with the other stuff. Um, but the racial injustice, the systematic racism um, that that critical race theory exposes, is is it's a fact. And at the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ is social justice. If you look at Wow. I have trouble trouble with that statement. Um now if he would have said, Hey, um the ramifications of the gospel, uh what the gospel produces, I, I wouldn't have taken an issue with that and I would wouldn't have responded to it. Um I mean, that would be true. God does uh you know, the gospel does uh come about socially and, and causes change. Absolutely. I wouldn't have a problem with that. But to say it's the heart of the gospel? No, justification is the heart of the gospel. Um, you know, the atonement is the heart of the gospel. Uh, God's glory <laughs> is even the the heart the heart of the heart of the gospel. But to say the 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 the, the, the heart of the gospel is um, dealing with the ramifications that that's troubling. But I want you. Let's let's listen up real quick and see the text that he uses. OK. Chapter four, verses 18 and 19, which is which Luke chapter four, verses 18 and 19. Jesus's public introduction to his ministry is about social justice. When you look at. OK, so um, we look at Luke four. 18 and 19, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim li liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
So you read that text and you're like, what is, what is social justice about that? Oh, poor, liberty, captives, blind, oppressed. He's really thinking this is like in a physical sense. Obviously, the Lord does, uh, you know, liberate that, that that will be an end time eschatological event that happens when he when he when all things are consummated. Absolutely. But. And to assume this is about black people. The state of black people in America. I mean, because that's what he's applying it to. No, this is this is, has to do with spiritual. This is these are spiritual realities that the Lord um, is doing because. Because, uh, you know, um, if you go if you go up, you know, Jesus is it's Jesus beginning his ministry. Like he reads this and in verse 21, he says, I begin to say to them today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Wow. Today, not <laughs> anyways. And, and, and then after that, Jesus literally heals a man with a demon. He cast the demon out. So it's clear that the text is referring to that. Um, this is a spiritual reality, not, not just physical realities. And so, yeah, I, I have uh, major issues with that interpretation. Major. Jesus parable uh, about the goat and the sheep in Matthew 25. It's about social justice at the heart of Jesus is of, of God's soteriological plan is social justice okay so luke 4 18 through 19 um it was just asserted it is about social justice no kind of exegetical uh no no at least no brief kind of explanation of why it just is matthew 25 about the um sheeps and the goats he didn't even get the text there but he's talking about 31 through 40 how is this about social justice it's just asserted and assumed I don't know. I don't know. It's just like I said, you have to believe it. You just start off with the with the uh, the conclusion. You assert it and then you conclude it. No proof given. And I think to to dichotomize to dichotomize um, what is considered what is called the anti-racist message from the gospel of Jesus Christ and even worse. To suggest that the anti-racist message that is preached and proclaimed by social justice movements. I, I don't like that term. That's, uh, <laughs> you know, if you don't agree with the so, social justice, the critical race theory, you know, you're labeled an anti-racist. Um, you know, or, you know, as if you're um, and the and the point is, like, you're, you're the one actually promoting the racism. But if you actually see. They're the ones actually promoting racism, you know, you know, but, or, or, or sorry, sorry, I actually have that wrong. What they're saying is, um, you know, it's not enough to be not racist, but you have to be anti-racist, which is <laughs> if you're not racist, you're anti-racist. I mean, that's, uh, you know, you hear from Ibram Kendi, um, you know, all those things like that. Um. And what he means is it's not enough to just have this belief and, you know, I mean, treat people kind and nice. I mean, that's not enough. What you have to do is activism work. It's like, OK, well. Apply that to other situ situations. It's not the, not enough to be uh, uh, anti uh, uh, against lying. You need to be doing the work of anti lying. It's like every sin, every you could do that with anything and it'd be ridiculous to make it antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ when it is actually the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ I, I mean that to me that's at the level of reprobation wow I mean so and I think I have uh, Owen here responding to that but if you disagree with social justice critical race theory on, on, on the issue of uh, you know discrimination in the state of the black man in America you're at reprobation Wow. I mean, that that's a strong statement. I mean, no exegesis, no foundation was provided for it, but <laughs> strong statement nonetheless. Man. Wow. Well, one thing we can agree on, on 
is you stated that white supremacy is on the other side of God. I completely agree. Uh, yet I must also su also say that what you are suggesting is an assumption. It's not an assumption. The Tea Party movement was strongly supported by the white evangelical church, racist movement. The Bertha movement, strongly supported by the white evangelical church, a racist movement, a white supremacist movement. Again, um, proof of systemic racism, racism today? <laughs> he brings up the Boston Tea Party. <laughs> what in the world does that have to do with anything today? Um, <laughs> and I, yeah, what what does that have to do with anything today? Um, and 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 just the the number of 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 spiritual hypocrisies that occur on a daily basis here in America um, uh, through those, not everyone, but certainly a good number of people in the white evangelical church it, it is is racist spiritual hypocrisy is done by majority of white people in the church well, well okay that's racist that's so vague it's, it's it doesn't actually ex explain anything it doesn't it doesn't explain anything i mean the same statement could be said backwards and it would be true to one extent all oh, the uh spiritual hypocrisy done by the black church and I, that's racist. That, that that doesn't prove what you just asserted. No one's arguing there that there aren't spiritual hypocrisies in any church. But to go on and just assert, well, there, therefore it's racism. And and and, and it reflects <sighs> um 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 white supremacy. I mean, to claim to have a monopoly on God, which there are many in the modern white evangelical tradition who do. Who? Who call them out? <laughs> call them out. Uh, get the quote, because he's saying it's many. It's he's not saying this is a uh, you know um, a minority issue in the white community. Because I, I would say, yeah, do you have people that believe that? Absolutely. But he's saying it's majority. This is like if you go in a white church, majority of the people there believe either they're in right standing with God by being virtue of being white, or they have the right theology. By virtue of just being white. I mean, call them out. Who's saying that? No one. <laughs> no one's saying that. I ain't to have a monopoly on God. Nobody else knows God but them. And attempt to impose their sanctimonious um, moral codes on people in society through the courts is, and I, I saw a few quotes in your book, is uh, persons now in the uh, white evangelical um, tradition such as John MacArthur and others who are condemning um, um, social justice, demonizing um, social justice movements, all of a sudden they're so in love with Martin Luther King Jr. Do you know what persons in the white evangelical? You know, they, they missed the point because uh, obviously it's mu much more nuanced than that because MacArthur wouldn't, and a lot of the people who agreed and signed the social justice statement um, have nuanced feelings about uh, Martin Luther King they disagree a lot theologically with him uh, morally speaking with him but on the issue of uh, standing for equality uh, many times King got it right and I know there's some, some inconsistencies I believe with uh, uh, Luther King um, Martin Luther King um, but he argued, he wanted the equality he, he didn't want to be treated differently than the white person based on skin color and, and you know it's all about this issue of character and he was right on that issue and so, yeah, um, that's not to say that they didn't have their differences or disagreements with King. K King had a lot of troubling stuff, you know, especially theologically speaking. Edition called MLK in the 50s and the 60s. They called Martin Luther King what? A Marxist, a communist. So it's, it's the same erroneous narrative that people who are fighting. And I'm going to have a own respond i'm not even going to respond to this because i think his response was just great it doesn't it doesn't need me to respond so <laughs> watch this for equal rights and social justice and doing it in the name of jesus because social justice is at the heart of the gospel of jesus christ and social justice is a major part of biblical witness i, I it just seems like um the the go-to villainization is to call call every anyone fighting for um, 
preaching and proclaiming social justice and trying to get equal rights for everyone as as Marxists. Black Lives Matter leaders have explicitly said that they're Marxists, so it's not a slur. Uh, it's a fact. If you look at black liberation theology, if you look at James Cone's writing, for example, he says that Marxism is the tool of social analysis that explains injustice and oppression in America in a way that capitalism cannot. Um, uh, Marxism is, is the foundation of critical theory, which is the foundation of critical race theory. So it's not a slur. It's it's yep. um, it's just being faithful to the intellectual heritage of critical race theory to say these things. You have Black Lives Matter founders, Patrice McCullers and others saying explicitly that that they have Marxist ties. You have Ibram X. Kendi working in that oppressor oppressed dynamic. You have uh, D'Angelo uh, in a softer kind of way, of course, talking about oppressor oppressed dynamics that cannot be overcome. Mm -hmm. It's obvious that uh, this movement has uh, has owes a great deal. I'll say it that way to Marxism. And Marxism, as I say, is bred to divide, and that is exactly what critical race theory does. It divides people, it separates us, it teaches us that we have more that divides us than we have uh, that which unites us. And, and I fundamentally reject that in common grace terms as image bearers, well, well, and I also reject that in the church. Well, well let's... Amen. <laughs> well said, Owen. Um, I couldn't have said it better. Uh, I think that's so true. It's, it's not just labeling people Marxist because... Oh, I don't like you. And I'm trying to demonize you because I really don't want to love my neighbor and all this. No, you guys are many um, are advocating for critical theory, critical race theory, which the foundation is uh, um, Marxism and, and BLM Marxism. And they, 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 they've said these things. So everything Owen said, I echo. My, my book is actually not about CRT. My book is about. <laughs> the theological scandal and corruption of oppressive white Christian theologies over time, at least over the last um, four centuries. So let's be clear about that. The other thing is, I'm not suggesting everybody's a white supremacist at all. <laughs> However, I do believe However. <laughs> that because of this theological scandal that I outline in my book and because of the historical and perpetual reality of of systematic racism in America um, I mean I guess it depends on how you define privilege but it's a system that has been has been constructed and created to privilege white persons over non-white persons I wanted to ask um, Jermaine Reverend Jermaine in our in our conversation by the way if you're tuning in now didn't see the beginning uh, check out the conversation I had with uh, Reverend Jermaine. Um, I wanted to ask him, what can white people do that black people can't? Because there was a time in history in America where black people couldn't do everything white people could do. But I don't think we're in that time now. You know, anything that white people can do, black people can do. Um, there's nothing stopping from from a black person uh, owning their company, their business, being successful mirroring a certain ethnicity there's it uh, being president i mean we see that you know now a lot of people say well look at the disparities well you wouldn't expect 13 percent of the population i.e black people to uh have uh the majority of the jobs why because they are minority so just logically it, it what they're asking for doesn't even make sense they're not arguing for equality a lot of these guys want equity which is not the same we're not living in a utopia. We're living in the reality that that racism has been has been America's original sin from its inception and continues to be America's original sin. And on so guess what? It's, it's this original sin. It's this sin that's inherited. It's passed down. So I, I don't know how you say on one hand, uh, you know, all white people aren't guilty, but hey, original America is uh, racism is America's original sin. And when he mean America, he means white people. He doesn't mean like everybody born in America because he wouldn't say he has this original sin of racism. But it's the sin passed down. Um, you, you can never get rid of it. And I asked him that. and He said, yeah, that's true. You can never you can never get rid of it, never escape it. There's no redemption in woke theology, no redemption in critical race theory. Um, so, yeah, that's why, you know, many people have issues with this uh, theology. So 
much better than me because I'm sure he fully um, fully agrees with the doctrine original sin. The, doc, the condition is a condition that never ends. It's a condition that never ends according to Augustine. I do not recall Augustine ever making that statement that original sin never ends. Um, now, you know, there's this argument that uh, original sin was is wiped away or at baptism. Uh, but nevertheless, um, that's not original sin. There is a view of 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 redemption, especially from a reformed perspective. So so here's this issue. If America. Sorry, if if racism is America's original sin and therefore he's arguing that it never ends in his view, you can never rid racism. That's the problem. And I asked him that question and he was like, yeah, I agree with that conclusion you made. There's no redemption in woke theology. But I think it's just disingenuous uh, to suggest um, that 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 there's not a system of white privilege. It's not only disingenuous, it's, it's just it's just wrong. It's, it's wrong. It's just wrong because it does exist in America, has existed since. It, it just does. It just does. It's fact. Agree with it because it's, it's fact. You denying it? It's fact. <laughs> just, just facts. <laughs> just like I said, that's not an explanation. That's not a, a, a proof. What, what if we just argue the same? It just doesn't exist. It's facts. It's, it's, it's just facts. You just got to agree with it. It's facts. They were like, but you're not proving it. But it's facts. <laughs> it's just, that's not an argument. That's an assertion. The inception of this country. And let me say this. Racism is a generational curse, unfortunately. So guess what? It's this general cur generational curse, you know, typically in black uh, communities, like something like alcohol is like a generational curse. Well, his daddy was a drunk. He's a drunk. Great grandpappy was a drunk. He just this general curse. You can't escape it. Ugh, it's, I mean, what a terrible, what a terrible theology that you know would. Ugh, anyways, it is a generational curse. The sins of past white generations uh, is the foundation for the sins, the racist sins of present white generation. I, I mean, again, I, I just think we're living in two different Americas. I completely disagree. You bring up the civil rights movement. We we currently have a Supreme Court um, that unfortunately and disgracefully and repugnantly is trying to undo everything that the civil rights movement actually achieved. I don't disagree with that. But I think we're talking about two different issues because, you know, you got the Supreme Court wanting critical theory, critical race theory in schools and things like that. So I don't disagree with that statement. I think many people are trying to to uh, undo the success of the civil rights movement. Obviously, we're not speaking from the same reality, as he says. And so, I mean, again, we're living in two different Americas. I fundamentally disagree with your hermeneutics when it comes to the New Testament. I think social justice is at the heart of biblical witness. I think social justice. Now, guys. If you have not heard this statement that blew up the Internet, that has gone viral. <laughs> my, my, my Twitter went crazy when I posted this clip. Just check it out. Is at the heart of, 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 of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think a major part of the problem is that particularly the reform tradition is, is it, it, it commits the same, the, the same theological scandal that the Protestant reformers commit. And this is the scandal. The Protestant reformers do not recover the gospel of Jesus Christ. They recover Pauline theology. And, 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 and let me say this. Um, I love Jesus. I tolerate Paul. I, I approach Paul with a hermeneutic of suspicion. I love Jesus. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Right. I mean, tolerating Jesus. I, I had a friend, we were talking about this and he was saying, well, does he think the apostles other apostles, the, the churches kind of had his view that they were just tolerating Paul, like Timothy, like, hey, man, I love Jesus, but I just tolerate you, dude. Like, I mean, just give me give me the gospel of John and I'm good. <laughs> you know, um, obviously, this view was not the view of the uh, the biblical writers and the churches um, or, you know, 
the Orthodox churches and, and even the apostles day. Uh, Cause you know, they're always combating heresy. Um, what, what an arrogant statement, you know, you, because even in, even when we uh, had our discussion, we actually found out that he even said, Hey, yeah, I'm um, suspicious of Jesus. I, he has some suspicion of Jesus as well. So he tolerates Jesus as well. And so, you know, we kind of got into views of inerrancy. So, man, I, I would highly recommend and encourage you if you're watching this video to uh, watch that discussion that we had, because I, th I think it was an excellent uh, discussion. It was a respectful discussion. And I think you would be highly. Uh, I don't want to use the word entertained, but encouraged just watching that discussion, just knowing more so what he believes. Uh, Reverend Jermaine, I love the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, 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 and so. And, and so again, Generation. well, reparations is not just previous generations; it's actually current generations as well. And it's not just about slavery, as I as I alluded to earlier. Um, but I'll say this: I think color blindness racism is saying to me that the gospel says that you should just forgive and, and forget that any wrong has happened. Now, I talked about Pauline theology earlier. There, there's a scripture in Galatians, I believe it's six and nine. That's it. How are you going to quote Galatians when you just dismissed it? You know, um, <laughs> you just tolerated Paul. And now you're quoting him as authoritatively. You, you can't have both. And to the issue of colorblind theology. Yeah. Treating someone on the basis of their character, not the skin color, is a Christian principle. It's a biblical principle. And that's what people mean by colorblindness. Not that they don't see their ethnicity but they don't treat them on the basis of their skin color. Black, white, Hispanic, yellow, what, uh, brown. I say Hispanic, brown. They don't treat you on the basis of those skin colors. That's what people mean by color blindness. Um, and yes, we are called to forgive um, the most horrendous atrocities. That doesn't mean there aren't consequences as he tries to insinuate that, the, you know, the anti-woke side is uh arguing no <laughs> i mean guess what if you kill a person based on skin color yeah there should be consequences um but there can be forgiveness there as well um and one of the beautiful uh, examples of that I, I forget the case i forget the names but the guy in dallas who uh you know the police officer whether it's true or not she accidentally shoots him allegedly and um the 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 case with the um with the family man when when the verdict was given and all that man will nearly bring you to tears if you know the gospel man um because they embraced her they they told her they forgave her for 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 taking out her son the mother said that the brother said hey you killed my brother but i forgive you and many woke people were heated at that and i was like that's the gospel that is what God does for us. Though we've betrayed him, though we've mocked him, we contributed to the death of his son. God forgave us in Jesus Christ. We did nothing to earn that. And man, it, man, that, 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 that is the gospel he's bucking up against. Because he wants forgiveness without you know, this, he wants forgiveness with like conditions. So be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatever you sow, you shall reap. And, and so in my opinion, to just to one, just identify racism is just a sin as if it's just a sin somebody commits. And, and then also uh, to suggest that it just should be forgiven and forgotten about without any type of consequences, without any type of accountability. Again, at best, that's cheap grace. At worst, it's reprobation. I I haven't... I'm going to let Owen respond to it. So he, he does a lot better than I could ever think of do. So we'll end with this. said a word in support of what um, Jermaine has called cheap grace, and I would oppose it in full. Um, fundamentally... To forgive someone, to forgive someone is not cheap grace. To forgive somebody who has wronged you and wronged you in a terrible way is very costly grace indeed. It is the most costly grace there is. 
Amen, brother. Amen to that. Um, <laughs> like I said, I would encourage you if you have not watched the discussion I had with Jermaine, uh, I think maybe that will enlighten maybe some other things. If you've watched uh, the discussion with him and Owen, I encourage you to watch that discussion as well, because uh, I thought it was excellent. I thought Owen did a great job. And so um, hope, hope, hope you uh, <laughs> go back and watch those discussions uh, like right now. Make sure you like this video. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you're not subscribed, click the notification bell for to be aware of uh, episodes that come out. Um, make sure you email. Drop a question in the uh, chat section. If you have a question for me, hey, guys, you know how we do it here at All Things Theology. I'm K-Dub. Till the next time, grace and peace. Yeah.